golden age of the railway poster, the art of travel. Report headquarters at once. Full kit. No more holidays for me for a while. The golden age of the railway poster, which existed between the wars, was the result of a happy marriage between artists working in graphic styles and public spirited managers working for the railway companies. But with the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, the government took control of the railways. The holiday resorts were in effect closed for the duration, and Fred Taylor's subjects were no longer castles and cathedrals, but trains carrying guns, shells and bombs. There were occasional reminders of the happier days when summer came soonest in the south, such as in this poster for the Red Cross based on the familiar Southern Railway poster portraying a small boy looking admiringly up at the engine driver. It wasn't hard for the railways to tune their image to their newfound propagandist role. They had, after all, been advertising the attractions of Britain for the past 20 years. The images of trains steaming ahead and the railway as a working system all pulling together were potent patriotic symbols. And from now on, the pictures tended to concentrate far more on the railway itself as a subject. By the end of the war, the railways were in a state of considerable disrepair, and it was clear that they would soon be nationalised as part of a coordinated transport plan. In 1947, the four groups were divided into the regions of British Railways, and a new logo and a new livery expressed the nationalised identity. Although for a while, the Western region continued to assert its independence by putting Western in the lozenge rather than British Railways. In the early years of nationalisation, the British Transport Commission emphasised the freight haulage role of the railway in helping to rebuild Britain. Even a farm could be moved, if that was your wish. The Britain we were now seeing by train and by poster showed a different land from the select services and popular resorts of the 20s and 30s. In keeping with the mood of the times, austerity became the theme. The railways were helping to rebuild British industry, and the pictures recalled some of the industrial subjects of the posters from the 20s. And in steel, Norman Wilkinson even chose the same subject. The modernist art movements, which had contributed so much to the development of commercial graphic styles in the pre-war Art Deco years, had changed. New experimental art was less easily adaptable to commercial needs, and colour photolithography was beginning to emerge. More than anyone else, Terence Cuneo reflected the post-war changes in pictorial style and subject. Well, it started once, curiously enough, from, from a sketch I did of an Essex mill, and this was seen by the, the publicity uh, fellow on the LNER, and he said, would I do this, alter it slightly for their proportion, as a double royal poster, which I did. And after that came the commission to do Giants Refreshed. And from then, I really went. That, that was the beginning of Because that was an extremely popular poster. Well, the steam lo locomotive is the appeal, of course. And uh, I, just, I just love the wretched things. And there's something about, you know, they're alive. They're not like a diesel or an electric, which, is a, which to my mind, is a, is a puppet, really. You know, you swing a lever and it starts, you swing a lever and it stops. And it might have been in a museum after that for ages. But the steam locomotive lives all the time. I've sat in them at night in the shed and they're wheezing and uh, the fire's still there. And they're sort of grumbling to themselves, you know. And, and, and that's what it is. I think that's the appeal. The days of steam were numbered. Terence Cuneo's work became a swan song for a vanishing era and nostalgia for the past became an added ingredient in the fascination of steam. 
Frequently in his pictures, diesel and steam can be found together, illustrating the tension between old and new. The confidence of the captions in these highly popular posters belied the increasing realisation that the railways were going to have to adapt to a rapidly changing world. And it wasn't just the locomotives that were changing. Colour light electric signals under the British Railways modernisation plan, as the poster explains, could be worked automatically or controlled from an electric signal box. Gone was the muscle of the early shift. The old certainties of red lever for stop, yellow for distant and black for points were under threat. And so it seemed even more important to show the correct details. At the same time, the landscape tradition continued emphasising the continuity of place in a progressing world. This was epitomised by the work of James Mackintosh Patrick in Scotland. Somebody came with you from British Rail, I think it was the public relations officer, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but he came with a lot of, lot of occasions and he would have suggestions and you would say, yes, that, that would be all right, yes, I think that would make a poster. Or uh, sometimes, because the posters were upright, it wasn't always too easy to find a subject, he would want a distant view of Creef or something, but this obviously had to be uh, uh, a long ways poster, otherwise you'd have a great lot of sky and nothing at all. No, but, and uh, uh, I would say, no, I, I don't think that's possible to make that into a, a close-knitted design. And I would suggest something else. That, no, I don't think that would be suitable. And then I spent, most of, probably spent the best part of a day going around looking at things until we decide what would be the best subject. By the late 50s, the pressure of continental holidays, cars and road freight was taking its toll on the railways. Prestigious travel was now by plane not train. The seaside towns went all out for the family holiday market. To be select was no longer a possibility. In this world of puffy white clouds and rock pools, Dad was never to be found without his briar, and the kids sought amusement in the seashore rather than the arcade. Posterland was now a place of happy families, sand castles, and increasingly more than just a hint of... well sex. The art of the pictorial railway poster really came to an end with the economies of the early 60s. Art and industry parted. Advertising became, well, just advertising. But the railways had made a major contribution to the art of the poster. Posters which were designed to be seen at a passing glance are now attracting the attention of a new generation. As well as the major collection at the National Railway Museum in York, collectors bid hundreds of pounds for the posters at auction. Art, which was once found in the gallery of the platform, is now reaching a new audience. 